show and thank you everybody for joining us today. It's really nice to have you guys here. Today is our third Speak Up by Smiley Movement chat. Uh, and today we're gonna to be talking about, as you all know, um, the LGBTQ plus community and social activism. Um, just like to clarify, uh, in terms of like terminology, I'm going to use the words LGBT, well, the phrase LGBTQ+, and also on the rainbow, because that's just like a silly little thing my girlfriend and I use at home, and it's just kind of nice and nondescript umbrella terms. So yeah, just to get us started, um, maybe we could just talk a little bit about why you think social activism is such a important part of the LGBTQ plus community. You're looking at me. Yeah, I yeah, am. Yeah. I am. <laughs> um, Targeted. I, th I think it. I think it's. It's quite simply. It's because, you know, as, as soon as you realise you're part of this community, you then start this journey of discovery to find out that actually, on broadly speaking, society doesn't particularly provide for you, and so actually anything that we've got, sort of rights-wise and things like that, actually have had to be gained through action and very rarely through the rest of society sort of saying, no, oh, actually, they, they should have this. So I think that that is essentially, from my perspective, kind of why you end up with, you know, the social action element of being part of this community, because if we don't have action, we essentially say exactly where we were, which is probably in the shadows and not being seen, provided for, and things like that. So that's, I think that's probably my take on it. I don't know what everyone else thinks. Yeah, absolutely. That's when you made that yeah. like <laughs> You like turn and I was like, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that the, I mean, the LGBTQ plus community was pretty much born from people striving for social change. Like it wasn't just people conjugating together. And even when that was happening, it was because there was a need for that. And that was a lack of ability to do that publicly. And you can't really have a community without there being that kind of activist undertone because you very quickly realize the second you step into it that that is necessary for there to be any kind of progress or for you even to just be able to live your life freely like i went to pride for the first time when i was 14 and that at the time i thought it was just a party but <laughs> it <good>. was pretty <laughs> I was like, yeah, rainbows music, it was fun. But then you kind of quite quickly realize like what the origins of it were and that it isn't just a party. It's also like, there's a reason why there's a parade and there's a reason why there's flags and everything. And so like, I feel like it's so intertwined that you really can't have it without the activism aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Lip, do you have any thoughts as you're right next to her? Yeah, um, I, can, I really agree with both of those kind of takes on it. I think also there is this element of like, obviously community and it, activism brings people together in a way um, that some people might, a lot of people I think find entering entering the community uh, quite a, a daunting thing to do. Mm. So to have a, a reason, a cause, like a movement to, to partake in is quite a beneficial thing for a lot of people. Yeah, I think for me, um, having come from a minority sort of group, you know, people of colour, we'd have to fight for everything. We'd have to fight for grants or scholarship, housing, um, to even get a place in, in you know, e events and stuff like that, you know. So I think it's only come natural um, when, you know, even in, in terms of LGBT, we are already segmented small in, you know, um, and then it's just like uh, born out of like necessity because we'd have to go through all this and then it's just it's just giving a, a fighting chance for another people to 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 hear us you know that's what social activism i think for me anyway mm. um having gone through a lot of stuff you know being uh well in my home country and when i was the majority i understand what the other the minority ethnics are feeling having coming here and live here and in australia in other countries as well so I, I feel at home uh, with the minority and which is why social activism is important to me and, and being in the LGBTIQ plus uh, 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 umbrella is even uh, more amazing because you know, we can hear the challenges from other people and, and share with them and then try to help each other. I really like that point actually about you know, hearing other people's stories and challenges and you know, we all come from different parts of this community but you know we're all here today all supporting each other and you know did some research because 
I had to, it's my job. <laughs> but we, fa we found that, um, you know, people within the community, people who are on the umbrella, are 20 times more likely to be involved in LGBTQ plus rights, like activism, but also two to four times more active within other social justice spaces. Um, I don't know if you guys have any, like, thoughts on that and also just thoughts on, you know, how you guys feel about other causes like, I don't know, either environmental change, migra migration, sorry, um, or anything like that. Yeah, I, I, I think I think it's when you realise that you're, you're part of a minority and that actually, you know, you see how systems can work against you, that you then start to explore, well, what's that like for other people? And you then have an affinity uh, and a, even just a, an appreciation of that that's going to be really quite difficult kind of observing someone else's situation, even though you haven't necessarily lived it, you've now got enough empathy through your own lived experience to sort of go, well, actually, that seems like a, a really challenging situation too. And I think you can even, if you look at our history, if you go back through the, sort of the LGBT movement and you go back to sort of lesbians and gays support the minors, well, that is exactly that again, really. It's social action where kind of, you know, the kind of queer community at that time when actually this group's been incredibly oppressed and marginalised for standing up for their rights. We recognise that because that's our lived experience too. So we want to get alongside that and they may not obviously seem like things that you would put together but that's what happens when groups feel like they're being I suppose oppressed or othered or marginalised in some way and then it's very once you've experienced that yourself you then realise that this happens way more often than you think and it's you then can see that in other organisations. So I think that's probably part of yeah. where you see that crossover into other movements. But I mean, others may have other views on that, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, that's kind of what I would say. I think it's um, that's very much how I feel about it as well. Um, there is so much shared oppression that. We, but we're all like ultimately we're all fighting the same fight, and I don't really like the I don't like <laughs> fighting so much. But like we're all dealing with the same mm. issues, struggles. Um, they're they're not completely the same. But I, th I think I was something I say to people quite a lot is that 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 you know like when there's infighting, or one group is fighting against another group, it frustrates me because we're ultimately fighting against the same problems, if it's even if the issues themselves are different. And I think, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was Silvia, Silvia Rivera who said, any protest you go to, you're gonna find trans women there because we understand that the struggle is the same. And I, I really think that that translates through, through the history of our community, at least. We're just showing up for every, every movement. Yeah, I'd agree with that, that entirely. I think that, that really resonates, you know, that once you've experienced that, that position of being on the outside of something, you very quickly get to understand what it's like for other people and see mm -hmm. how those groups are. Kind of, and, and, and actually, how just consistent that, that is in its application towards a particular group. Obviously, you know, if we're talking about, um, you know, people at the moment now and how someone's identity is weaponized against them. So, you know, there's lots of things we could talk about within the LGBT community, but you can just very easily see that in exactly the same thing in the idea of people in boats on the channel and how that's entirely weaponized language now. And it's very easy to have empathy with that because you understand what it's like to be on the, the receiving end of that too. So I'm not surprised you see that crossover, really not. Yeah, absolutely. Do you guys yeah, I mean, I feel like it's all so interconnected that you can't really tackle one without effectively tackling the other things. I mean, you can't talk about homophobia and tackling homophobia without also kind of tackling sexism and seeing how that influences that. And then when you start looking at sexism, then you start to notice how racism plays a role in that. And then when you think about racism, then social class comes into it and all these things kind of connect together. So I think that once you kind of start unpacking why one group is oppressed in some way, you start to see that there's all like a kind of overarching theme for all of it. And then you just kind of become more interested in dismantling as much of that as possible. Although that's not to say that everything is always intersectional in the way we tackle it. Otherwise, like the progress flag wouldn't exist. A lot of it <laughs> hasn't been as intersectional as yeah. it could have been. But I do think that it's, it is the inherent intersectionality of it is the reason why people do tend to kind of be interested in multiple causes at once. 
Yeah, I mean, like coming back to your question, that like, sometimes it just happened organically and, and naturally. Like, I just want to point out that this the the Gary Lineker saga, mm-hmm. where he actually housed uh, refugees and asylum seekers and in his house, and then, you know, only then he knew what is their the the actual struggle and challenges, and then, and then put it on out there just for people to know that you know the language that's been used by the, the government is you know not dissimilar. To, to those back then, you know, so it's it's in, sometimes it's just you know when you're you're struggling yourself, and then you you are in a in a group that have the same kind of uh, mindset, and and uh, it just came naturally, I think, you know, for some people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think just like speaking personally, um, I mean, beforehand we were talking about it's a sin mm. um, and things like that, and I, I feel like particularly within the LGBTQ community, but also a lot of other. Uh, minority communities there's almost like a shared grief um, and you know I know this is smiley talks but I don't think you can have the smiley without acknowledging that shared grief yeah um, and I, I see that quite presently in you know climate activism and you know all these other social causes I, I mean sat at this table uh, do any of you guys have uh, other than obviously LGBTQ plus rights um, do you are, are there any causes you're like particularly passionate about that you you know are lobbying for that you are interested in progressing I do I have yeah. um, a, a couple of uh, things that I'm sort of going through um, I am part of the group called this called olive um, uh, program where we we get um, um, LGBTIQ uh, plus uh, asylum seekers as well as normal refugees to ha- to have a place to um, pursue their tertiary education in, in universities and it's also part of the uh, AT University actually uh, all across in, in the UK where we would uh, ask other other universities to uh, allocate some places for for people who came here who has some kind of qualification who wants to uplift themselves. Um, and another thing that I was doing, uh, well, I'm still doing now, is the, is the Borderless Project, which, which we invite uh, LGBTIQ um, asylum seekers and, and um, uh, stateless uh, uh, dis- uh, displaced people to come to, to have a platform where we do creative stuff and creative writing and then uh, screening of LGBTIQ movies and you know, documentary and stuff like that. So that happens every Wednesday in Stratford, and yeah, That's you great. should come. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna <laughs> say, of, can I be invited? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's a borderless. We should so. all go. Yeah. <laughs> like, <that's it> after. <laughs> Stephanie, do you have any like causes at all? Yeah, well, about? I suppose the other thing that yeah, I suppose um, that, I, that I'm involved in, I suppose it would be easy to say, is that um, I'm really, really proud to be a trustee of another organisation, which is uh, Crystal Palace Football Club's mm-hmm. Community Foundation, and what that does is it uses the power of sport to reach young South Londoners that are actually often in really difficult situations and are maybe uh, exposed to some of the kind of things that, um, again, maybe mainstream media weaponizes in their identity somewhat around how they perceive certain sections of, say, particularly sort of young black men uh, in sort of, you know, kind of urbanized areas and the opportunities that they may or may not get as a result of where they live. And, you know, the foundation does a load of work to try to, you know, to to challenge that and to, to challenge people's thinking around that and to provide interventions that give people different routes. And I think that that's, that for me, that's really important because actually you're talking about, you know, you're talking about the talent of a city in this instance and actually really brilliant people who are probably not getting the opportunities that they should realistically get by dint of where they live, what they look like and the kind of economic um, opportunities they've had through their lives which lead them into a certain position and that's literally the factors that make the difference mm-hmm. and so I'm really really interested in, in that work and that the, the, the foundation does there for me that's like something that's a way it's different to, to what I do as my day job but it's something I'm equally as passionate about um, and it matters to me and it may seem odd it's a sort of connection but you know when I go to watch the football club I recognize that actually the people in the stadium often don't look like the ones that live in the area and there's a reason for that and it's economic and and that's not right and actually I really love that there's a an ambition to do something around that and actually in this instance it's the club it's or the foundation that's grasping that so we're not going to wait we're going to try and do something around this ourselves so that for me you know social mobility I think is really important yeah what you 
guys, is there, any, is, you know, is there anything that like really gets you <laughs> fired up a little bit? Um, well, I mean, a lot of my work is centered around asexuality, which is part of the LGBTQ plus community, but you wouldn't know based on how rarely it's mentioned. Yeah. So a lot of my stuff has been centered around not just raising awareness, but also trying to like drive the conversation forward in terms of like legislative change and progress, um, like co-founded International Asexuality Day, which is actually tomorrow at the time in which we're filming this. Um, and also launching the first ever asexual rights initiative with Stonewall. So we're producing a report into asexual discrimination in the UK, specifically in healthcare, the workplace and in education, because we're not protected by the Equality Act. It's not asexuality, it's not actually recognized as an orientation under that. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of protections that we don't have. So I was hoping since there isn't really any research into that, getting some of that data out there, I think would be helpful in not just raising awareness of those issues, but also making people aware of how like ace phobia manifests and also trying to do everything I do in a very intersectional way because whenever asexuality is mentioned, as rarely as that is, it is often very whitewashed in its depiction. So I try to incorporate that in as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> coming to you. You're coming to me. <laughs> um, I would say sex worker rights. Um, I think the, the stigmatization, the um, the provision of safe spaces to work, um, everything that goes with sex worker rights mm. um, is something that really, yeah, I, be I believe quite strongly in. And I think that um, so many people do not understand um, anything about sex work yeah. and and that is part of the problem so education is a big part of that um and i yeah i think it kind of speaks for itself yeah yeah why, no absolutely why, that's my thing yeah. <laughs> no it, there was um i don't know if you saw it um the bfi if you got the chance to go yeah, along the stroll uh, the mm. film the stroll incredible film okay really amazing film about um black trans women in 14th street in new york uh, meatpacking district um, and their stories and how their stories have been told by other people over the years and how they went back and reclaimed this footage and then retold the story. Got it all back from loads of different archivists. It's really powerful. It's, it's yeah. I put that in. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's one of the best things I've ever seen. Really I feel is. like the, the kind of conversation around sex work is, is also really entwined in the LGBTQ plus community, but also just in the conversation about how much the government has failed. Yeah. Mm. Because there is no, there's just so such limited provision for anyone struggling, mm. anyone, anyone minoritized. Um, that I think that's that's one of the things that really gets me about sex work, sex worker justice is that um, it's perceived as a bad thing, um, and like. The, the narrative is so often that people who do sex work have no choice. But then the, the reason why there is no choice, potentially there is often a choice for, yeah. for people. But sometimes the, the, the idea that there is no choice because of the, the failure um, and the environment that's created limited options is just left out of the narrative completely. Mm -hmm. um, and that to me is just so like typical of the, the climate we're in at the moment, but also just quite insidious um, and, and really illustrates how powerful people like lead the narrative so often. Um, and we really, that's kind of why I think like all of, all of us are here um, because we all believe in amplifying the voices of people who don't actually get to speak up that much. Did I just drop, is that what this is called, speak up? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my god, you did it! Well done! Well done! I think we should just let it You have to prepare that beforehand. Come on, well done! You're a pro at this. Yeah, yeah. you're so good at this. I'm so glad we've got one pro at the table. <laughs> so, what sort of solutions do you think need, need to be there? Uh, what, you know, are there any charities that you think are doing particularly good work towards that or any organisations? Or do you have any thoughts on what we need to do to move forward within society. What I say to a lot of people um, who visit the community centre is, um, who, who, we have a lot of people who visit and say, I wish there was a place like this where I live, or, um, or who, who are just kind of hankering for change. Um, and what I say to all of them is, we started from a few people having a chat 
saying we need this to exist and then work happened and and I think there are organizations across the world doing really positive work um, but but also individuals can do really positive work and that's why yeah. social justice and the social justice movement is so powerful because people are people are powerful and if we get together and organize we become even more powerful um, and what I, th I can't remember who said it, I'm sorry, but someone said something about collective grief. I think it was you, actually. Mm, um, mm -hmm. And I think that's another thing that I say often about um, the community centre in particular, because I want the community centre to be a place where people can have fun and really bask in everything that's wonderful about being queer, um, but also acknowledge and remember and learn from the all the trauma from the past um, that our community has kind of dealt with and overcome because there is still a lot more to do. And I think if we can look at the past and acknowledge all the, the trauma, we can learn from it and move forward and like continue this um, movement really. Absolutely. But yeah, also remember to have fun. And that's when you were talking about um, your Wednesdays in Stratford, mm -hmm. that's something I, believe so much in getting people together to just not even talk about the fact that they're part of the LGBTQ plus community, just do some knitting, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. make some pottery because it's, it's possible to just have fun as part of this community. It's possible to have a great time and not be like fighting all the time. And it's important. Yeah, I, th I think that's really true. And I, if you, you know, in terms of when people organize and get together, you know, that, that's the story, a switchboard right there. You know, that, the switchboard's going to be 50 next year, but it's going to be 50 next year because right now, 49 years ago, a group of people came together and said, we don't have this and we need it. And how do we make this happen? And then they just made it happen and it's been going ever since. And, you know, I always find it interesting when I chat to the volunteers at Switchboard and I think that when you volunteer for Switchboard, that's a real piece of social activism right there. You know, that they give up all the time to train and become part of this organization that's, you know, there's had so many people pass through it. But ultimately, they've walked in the door for two reasons. One is they want to help. They just want to help other people. But the other thing is they want community as well, and actually community in a kind of positive way. And to be around. and actually sometimes that's just fun. And just chatting to people and hanging out in a different space and making new connections and getting alongside people that ex understand their experience. Because maybe in their work life, they don't get that at all. So switchboards are one place where they do get that and actually kind of gives a bit of community to it. So I think you're right, once you start these kind of, um, just make a decision to do something, you don't know what else is going to come out of that and what the spin-offs of it are, but almost always they're pretty good, you know. So I would definitely say that that's, you know, just, just making a, any, any form of individual activism is useful because you do not know where it might lead. Actually, I was inspired by a lot of the stuff that you guys just said, and this is one of my question cards, I'm going rogue. Um, but I thought it would be really nice if we could all just go around and share a moment where you've felt like real, you know, joy and peace within the like queer LGBTQ plus community. Uh, you know, like your Wednesday night things, like seeing people being happy at the center. Just just a moment that like, I mean, you could have a second to think about it while I'm waffling. Um, but just like a moment that you've, really fa felt that joy and happiness about being part of this community because it, it you know as much as there is grief and stress there is so many wonderful moments that i found for me it was bright yeah it was bright because it, 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 i almost cried you know like uh, um i've been to the mardi gras in, in sydney and you know other places but it's not the same you yeah. know i feel like Maybe this is my home from home. You know, I've been here like, I mean, 21 years. Mm -hmm. It's only like this year that they, they gave me this, the, the leave to remain. Um, you know, it's a long story. But um, when I see in a couple of prides that I went to, and I see the people, you know, like uh, uh, on the side cheering you on and stuff like that, it makes me like want to cry and yeah. like, you know, like they, they've accepted me. And I was with another guy, we were just hand in hand and kissing and stuff like that, you know? And, and uh, it, it, yeah, it just feel right. And it feels like, you know, there is some support, you know, that you can feel it, you know. And, you know, I, I know it's been, you know, um, how do I put it? Uh, 
pride has become a different things, mm. right? But it is true a struggle, and for people who like me who came from abroad and and seeing like how the people supporting, you know, on the on the sites and everywhere, it feels amazing, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I cried my first pride. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, you just see all the people in the feathers, and you're like, Aah! Stephanie, do you have? Um, yeah, I, I think I'm probably. In fact, no, I know I'm really lucky. Um, I, I think one of the things that I get like enormous pride from is uh, when volunteers come into Switchboard actually, and they um, they go for their training, which is you know, first part of it's about 30 hours, is sort of classroom based, and then they go onto the phones and they take their first call and there's an experienced volunteer sat alongside them. And I've been fortunate enough to be in the room sometimes when they've taken that first call and you can sense the nerves and the way of kind of the responsibility of all of this. And you never know what that call is going to be because it could be anything. From, there are such extremes that people reach out to us about. And seeing that person complete that first call, come off it and that sort of sense of like relief and also like, oh my God, I just did that, that's amazing. And I think, oh, I love that. For me, that is just, um, I love it because it's a community looking out for itself in a really, just in, in the most purest way, which is just, I'm just here to listen to you and I'm your person for this next little while. And I just think it, that for me is, yeah, I, I find nothing tops that, if I'm honest, in terms of like, it's the simplicity of it, I just, for me, it's really special. That's really beautiful. How about you guys? You got any thoughts? Could you repeat the question? <laughs> I was like, I was like, I had an answer, but I was like, let me just remind myself what the question yeah, was. No, 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 that doesn't like, actually yeah. match anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like you're me. We're back in school because like that. Was <laughs> um, do you have any thoughts about like uh, a moment where you've really experienced like the joy of like being part of this community? Yeah, I mean, it's true that like the whole Pride season is definitely like super joyous and. Being in like one of the parades is like the closest thing to a total rock star moment that I think <laughs> have of like screaming crowds and music and everything. But I think the one kind of highlight for me, I think, was when I um, I did this thing called Ace of Clubs, which was like the first ever asexual pop up bar. It was back in like 2019, um, and they had it like in Soho, and it was like the first time anything like that had really happened. And there aren't really many opportunities for asexual people to meet in real life or to have the space and particularly a space within like a kind of pride related thing. And everyone was just so hyped and so comfortable and every, it was just like a very happy, joyous, like two day occasion that would be, I really want to like replicate that because it was so good. And yeah, like that was kind of when I was like, well, you kind of get to tangibly see the impact that these things can have and that like personally being able to create that moment and that space for somebody else works. A lot of people were like, oh, I've never met an asexual person in real life before. Like aside from myself, like I've never seen people together before. So it was like a really like sentimental moment for a lot of people. And yeah, it was very fun. And I was glad to be able to kind of be part of that. So that's kind of like a highlight for me. Yeah, that's really beautiful. <clears throat> Mine is through through work at the center. Um, and I could honestly pick so many moments, but, and some of them are just like stepping back and looking at a room full of people who've kind of relaxed and are having fun. Mm -hmm. um, but more so than that, there's this one particular visitor who the first time they came in were, I honestly was almost similar to, to you talking about Switchboard. It was, it was like my first call. Um, if I was at Switchboard, it was a really difficult conversation where this person told me so many, so many things that they were going through, and um, and I just you know we had this conversation, and it was it was a lot um, for both of us, I think. And then they visited steadily for you know over the course of last year or whatever, and um, and then there was this day it was Trans Pride, and they at the end of the day. That's my thing with, with Pride is like, I keep the center open and I stay like, people come before Pride, before the, before the march and make their banners. And then I kind of like send them out the door, make sure they've got water and feel like mother. grandmother. <laughs> like, I really feel like grandmother. And then I tidy all the mess that they've made with their banner making. And then I sit there because someone's gonna come and cry. 
because pride is a really big emotional thing. And this kid came at the end of the day and just their smile was like the biggest smile I'd ever seen. And they were just like, I can't believe that I just did that. I can't believe I just marched like that. This, I can't believe this happened. And it's just like, for me, this, it is really like, it's a bit hypocritical from what I've said about like, it's so joyful to be queer <laughs> and like, let's just knit. But, <laughs> but for me, the really joyous moments do come with kind of overcoming the, the difficult stuff. And yeah, it's, yeah it was just, I, I think about that smile often because it just, it felt like the center's doing good work and we're all helping each other. Like mm. the community beyond, like way beyond the center is just lifting each other up. And that is so powerful. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't plan this. Maybe I did. Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, but like, I, feel, I think it's really interesting that like each and every one of you has picked a moment where people within our community are uplifting others and helping others and providing for others. You know, whether it's Pride, whether it's you at Centre, whether it's Switchboard, whether it's a pop-up, you know, each, each of us have like a really special moment where we provided for each other. Which kind of comes back to social activism and yeah, the idea absolutely. that like, no one else is providing for us. So yeah. we provide for ourselves yes. and each other. And that's what like, yeah. it's all about, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it, it's really important to note that, you know, social activism can come in the form of, you know, throwing bricks, or it can come in the form of protests, it can come in the form of lobbying for government change, or it can come in the form of, you know, seeds of compassion that are planted within each of us. I think that's just really, really beautiful. And like on that, is is there any social activist movements by like people within the LGBTQ community that like you know, we, we all represent charities here, but you know, are there any others? And you're just like, I really want to shout them out. Like, I, I just really feel connected to that cause. Yeah, I, I mean, I really like um, uh, a charity, not a phase, uh, <laughs> and Danny, uh, Danny, who set that up. I love the, um, I love the positivity of the message and the kind of, the kind of, the, the, yeah, the abundance of it and the positivity and the energy within that. Uh, which represents trans and non-binary people in a really positive way because literally nobody else does that right now. And I think that the work that they do through Not A Phase, I just love it. I love the kind of everything about it and um, the way that it's gone and look for really positive solutions for people that just want to get on with their lives and, you know, and, and to show um, people in everyday settings and, and, and just make that accessible, not only to, to the, I suppose the community that is aimed at, but also anybody else that sees it. So I, I, I yeah, that is, it, for me, I think is really interesting because activism can often be presented as just being kind of angry and like tub thumping and all the rest of it. And, and of course there's elements of it. There's no, no getting away from that. You know, I think you need a degree of that, but I think you also need, you need a bit of hope. You know, you need a bit of positivity. And I think that that, that organization does that really simply but really well yeah so i'll give them a big shout out absolutely uh, for me um i didn't know that i was a poet until <laughs> i have to go through the in the home office and the, the whole system you know <laughs> he brings out the poet in me, you know? <laughs> and um uh, this are you going to drop some poet bars <laughs> <laughs> right now <laughs> the, the, um, the new and poetry group they're really really nice people and then they uh, actually my ex lecturer from uh, university of uh, east london uh, Sonia Kintero, she was the one that organized it all and she she made it really like a nice safe space for all of us. So, I mean, uh, it's non-judgmental and and you all are welcome, you know, and and we, we do some kind of like themes as well. Like we have like the LGBT kind of theme, you know, uh, uh, going through in some of the weeks that we uh, we go there every Thursday and, and Saturday. And I mean, it, it you know it makes uh, it makes uh, a world of difference when you have people who are in in the same um, kind of uh, things that you do, like, like the poetry, but also uh, uh, understand the challenges that we face and and you know empathize uh, uh, you know within the community. And it's not necessarily have to be like a, an LGBT kind of uh, movement or, or a charitable thing. But there are many other different uh, um, charities around in the in London that I know of, and I was also a trustee and uh, was was active like the LGBT uh, site project. 
um, rainbow migration, which is I'm part on, uh, rainbow, uh, micro rainbow, um, uh, what, so many, so it's too, yeah. many, too many to mention, and uh, African rainbow family, yeah. you know, so like, there's there's plenty out there if, you know, everyone wants to. It's nice that there really are just too many for you to yes, mention right is, now, that's good. encouraging. Yeah, which is yeah. good, yeah, because in, in, uh, it's all like um, for different things as well, you have some for employment, there's some for for uh, you know, uh, access to education, there are some for different things. So, I know we have to be an ally for everything. You know, I don't mind. What you guys I think what come what kind of kind of came to my mind was mm. people like um, Pussy Palace and Gal Pals who mm. are putting on club nights, um, which are not necessarily directly social activism but I, but I I I think that's something that I found really really encouraging um, over the past few years is seeing how nightlife and partying within our community has changed so much mm. and it's become really about again supporting each other uplifting each other and just making sure we have door staff mm. who are going to be respectful to everyone and making sure that we've got like quiet spaces for you to kind of get away from the chaos of the club sometimes. Um, and I think, yeah, Gal Pals and Pussy Palace are really, really doing that, um, as are so many more. Um, another group I really want to mention is Black Stage, which uh, um, is an amazing organization platforming um, pole performers of color. And they have a huge, they support hugely sex workers and um, LGBTQ plus pollers as well. Um, and that is really like groundbreaking work mm. that they're doing because, because as with most things, the, the way that the poll or just polling in general has been kind of taken over by the majority, let's say, mm. um, is kind of, it's forgotten its roots and is, is kind of increasing marginalization, so yeah. Um, well, everyone has mentioned things that I like already. Yes. Um, now to think of one I, that's a little different, I would go for Queer Britain. I don't know yeah. if anyone's had the chance to go there. Um, I love that place. It's so good. And yeah, I would definitely have to mention that just because it's really just like marking our place mm. in history. Like we've always been here, we're here now, always going to be here. And I think having like a tangible spot where you can just go and gain all this information, which, you know, it's existed on like little internet archives and in people's mm -hmm. minds, but to have somewhere where like school children can go visit on a trip yeah. and access all of this information and be able just to see like, it's very sort of normalizing mm -hmm. in a sense. And it also just sort of, I feel like it's also just like really bringing together all of these achievements and all of these really underrepresented people and all of the kind of stories that kind of just got washed out of the narrative and emphasizing that. And I think that that's a kind of very powerful form of activism in a way that's more subtle in that it's, it's just a space. And yeah. the last time I went there, I was actually like a total dream come true because I ran into Sir Ian McKellen, which was like oh, my, my God. childhood God. dream. Gay royalty. <laughs> Literally, like I, I have a fellowship with the ring poster on my wall. So like I've always wanted to meet him like since I was a little kid and yeah. I just turned around and he was there and I freaked out. Oh my so. God. And that space is so important right now for, for the point you made at the beginning of this around um, you know, it's, fun, it's a place where someone can go and learn about our community. And this is at a time where it appears that the idea of education in like, you know, edu school settings of our identities is now back on the table mm -hmm. as to whether that's allowable or not. And so having um, Queer Britain and the museum, which tells those stories that we can make sure remains in place when perhaps other things might not, because we don't know what the future holds, that makes it even more important that Queer Britain's there and that we've got that space so that people can have access to that. Because otherwise, you're right, it just gets either fragmented, and then where do you find that information? Or it gets wiped away completely. So I think you're right, I think it's such a, I love that answer actually, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a good one. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's really nice that it's like a like physical permanent building as well. Like a city that's like similar to the center. Like it's mm, it's yeah. a it's a tangible thing that you can go to, you can touch, you can be present in. And it's it's nice to have that, you know, like almost like solid ground mm. for us to exist upon. Almost. Yeah, I think especially when we're thinking about museums, they tend to be very 
Terus Bory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, the, and they're only representing very specific things. Like when people think history is pretty much like old dead white guy <laughs> history and a bunch of stolen stuff. And that's pretty much <laughs> as far as it kind of goes often when you're thinking of the museums of London. But it's like there are so many things that happens that we don't really get to talk about. And that is very important aspects of our history that impacts everybody. So I think it's great just to also shine a light on that that is also important British history. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the things I guess that like we've all probably struggled with is having a safe space. Um, it, you know, whether that's at work, at home, you know, wherever. Um, and even within social activism spaces, although, although we're incredibly prevalent there, what do we need to do to help not only our community engage with social activism in the future, but also to create safe spaces where they can do that without feeling threatened or marginalised or othered? Um, I, will, I will answer. Um, I think that something that the community centre is trying to do is just that, where um, which is one of the reasons that we have the meetups before any protest or march that's happening in London is because we want people to, we, we call it a pre-protest pre meetup. Um, so it's a, just an opportunity for people to come together and feel like they've got someone that they have met that they can go to this thing with. Um, if it's their first one, if they just want to feel a bit more secure, a bit protected in a group like safety in numbers kind of thing. Um, and they've been so hugely popular. Um, the, the numbers, the amount of cleaning up, my mother has to do. Um, and it is amazing. Um, and you can you see these, the, the kind of importance. Um, and we sometimes we have like a banner making, placard making thing before the march or whatever. Um, and we're also trying to get, this is a project that we've been working on for quite a while, trying to reach out to organizations we think are doing great activism within our community and saying, will you come and do a workshop for kind of like training the next generation of activists? Um, I think ACT UP actually is is pretty good at that. They have a, a pretty dedicated, committed approach to planning their their work for the for the year kind of thing. like. And, and really opening up and saying like who wants to come and chip in and GLF as well. Um, but yeah, I think I think in terms of making a, a, like a safer space for activism, pr like training and and is that hmm, how do I say it? <laughs> making people feel like they're in a space that it, that they're welcome in, um, where there's no hierarchy, there's no. Um, no, like all ideas are valid kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, again, I'm, I'm really promoting the, the center, but it's just because I believe in it so much where we've kind of created this space where it's, it's not a bar, it's not a club, it's not a, like an educational building, it's not a museum, it's not any of these things. And it's kind of not a community center either. Like it doesn't feel like a dark, dank little, <laughs> piles of chairs in the corner place, it feels like somewhere you can come and sit down and relax and and interact with activism happening when you're not even there for it. You could just be there having coffee and, and you see that this group is talking about staging a protest or whatever it is and you could be like, oh, maybe that's a bit of me, I'll go over there. And I think that's, yeah, just like kind of quite subtle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think you've covered most of the key things there about this live around kind of just creating space. And I think you know, it, I think we also have to be, um, you know, constantly assessing ourselves about the environments that we're creating for other people, and not assuming that we've just arrived now and this is the destination. That actually, this everything's great now because even within our own communities, there are still journeys to be travelled in terms of people feeling safe around other aspects within our own communities. And I think that takes time and listening is a key part of that. And, you know, as an organisation, we have over 200 volunteers. They have wildly different life experiences from different perspectives and they're different, you know, they're different elements of the LGBTQIA plus um, communities. And so some will actually have had great deal of exposure to certain parts of that, but none to some other elements of it as well. And so actually education um, isn't just for everybody else, it's also for us too, you know? And I think that as long as you're kind of vigilant around that and understand that that's 
necessary, then I think you know you've got a good chance of creating those. And don't just just don't assume you've always got the answers because actually often there's other people that have the answers. And you just yeah. need to listen. Well, I think creating a safe space starts from home. You know, when you create yourself a, a safe space. I remember my ex, uh, Sebastian Smanowski. I mean, he's a great ex. You know, he's a good one. He's a good one. And he, he told me like five, six years ago that, you know, even though we are not too longer together, uh, but this is always going to be a safe space. My home is going to be a safe space. You know, it's, it's not just my home, it's your home too. And, you know, like, like, and then you're always going to be welcome, you know, you, your friends, whoever, you know. So if we can translate, you know, our own current, like, safe space that we have into, like, our workspace that is safe and, and, and in everywhere else, we're going to be a, a safe space, you know. So it's, it's, it's not just about the, you know, uh, the community at large, but also we, we, we kind of uh, ongoing safe space around us. You know, this this is a safe space, safe space, safe space station. <laughs> Sorry, astronaut on the right. Yeah, astronaut. Okay. <laughs> Former astronaut. Come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, we have to make it a space for for everyone too. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Any final thoughts, Jasmine? Um. Yeah. I mean, I think I definitely agree with just also just kind of allowing people to. Just reassuring them that it's like, you're enough, what you're doing is enough, what you want to do is enough. And also if you don't really want to do anything, like that's okay as well. Cause I think a lot of people kind of feel like, oh, well I just did this little thing and not that many people saw it. So, you know, it's not really, it's like, no, well, that's, that's great as well. Like you don't need to be on a front line or on a billboard or something for it to count. Like it doesn't have to be some big thing. And also if you did just want to show up and sit there, you showed up, that's fine. Or even if you're like, actually, I'm just trying to get through day to day. It's like, well, you're out there living your truth and being part of that. So that's also great. Like it doesn't actually have to be anything particularly dramatic or flamboyant to be activism. And if you do just wanna be supportive, but quietly, or you just wanna just get through, then that is also fine. Like it's not a competition and it's also while it's great if you do feel like you have the strength in that moment to do something, it's also not your job to do something just because you are part of a marginalized group. You can also just focus on yourself and surviving if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really important message. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something else then. No, just like... like... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much for joining me today, you guys. It's been a real honour, genuinely, and a privilege to speak to you all. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.